here's some things you, you maybe thought would change. And, and when, you're, when you've got your eyes on the prize and you're looking forward to that night, when you walk out of the room and everybody cheers and, and you go to the grad lounge and, and everybody buys you shooters and it's, it's, it's huge. It's, it's the day, that defense day. The next day is, is maybe a little bit different, but it's sort of like the day after a wedding. You know, you've planned this wedding for two years and everything is there and the next day everything's gone brilliantly and then the next day you get up and say, okay, what now? I'm married. Which may or may not be a good thing, but <laughs> all of the planning part that goes along with it is, um, is gone and it's missing. So you're going to wake up that day afterward and you're going to be Dr. You. And that's, a, that, that's an awesome thing, but you thought it was more awesome, it was going to be more awesome than it is frankly, and you've got that little bit of letdown. But here's the things that you thought, I can't wait to get finished and get into a real job. We talk about that a lot, the real job. So these things will change. That constant tickle in the back of your mind that you have your dissertation due, you know the date. It's emblazoned on our brains. I, I, I defended on the 22nd of April at 1 o'clock in the afternoon uh, in 1998. And I will forever know that date because it was in my mind for a very long time. But it's that school thing. You know when you get out of high school or university in the summer? That freedom that all of a sudden you're not walking around thinking, okay, I've got an exam next Wednesday and I've got to get working on that chemistry lab and I've got to get that English paper finished. That burden, that general academic burden that you feel is... Um, going to just go away because your dissertation, your PhD dissertation burden is a much bigger burden than any of those. Plus you're probably marking because you're probably doing some kind of TA work or teaching or prepping or teaching sessionally. So that's one of the things that you can't wait to have change. Here's the difference between when you got out of high school for the summer or you got out of your first year of your undergrad for the next, um, for the next while is that that's back and it'll never go away again. So you have to find a way in your mind to now make that fit into who you are. Because as soon as you go into a, a tenure track faculty position, the research monster rears its head. And it's, it's exciting. And there's a lot of us that really are looking forward to the research part, maybe even more than the teaching part. But the problem is you don't get in your first year, spend a tremendous amount of time doing your first grant, be successful in getting your grant money by the end of that year because the grant writing process never stops either. And then do your research, write your paper, and it's done and off your back. Because, of course, what are you doing? While one is in the works, you're writing a grant for another one, and then you're teaching. And if it's not prepping for classes and marking, this is part of the job. You've been well prepared for it because you've hung around in school for a lot longer than the average person. And once you were in your graduate school, it never really went away, did it? Like once you're in grad school, there's always something and you know it's coming. But don't be excited about this going away because you have to find a way to balance your life where that's just there. And you can still let yourself go out for a run on a Sunday morning or go on vacation for two weeks kayaking or do whatever it is that you want to do. You can't wait for that to be gone. You need to just assimilate it into who you are. Deadlines, same thing. You always, you know, you just can't wait till all these deadlines are over. You will have considerably more deadlines in your life when you are a full-time faculty member. The research grant deadlines are tremendous and they're always at really awkward times because there are no good times. And what they seem to do in most universities, this one, other ones I've been involved in, is they find out when the biggest, most important research grant deadlines are, you know, your big, your big shirk one, your um, big NSERC grant deadlines, your, your medical research council deadlines. And they go, okay, let's put a couple of other university things right at the same time just to see if they can handle it. I don't think that's the logic, but that's always what we sort of feel is the logic. So the deadlines will be there. Classes reign supreme in your life for deadlines. It is the one thing you will have no control over. You, they don't come up to you in your first week and say, nice to have you here as our new professor. When would you like classes to start? You think you'd like a couple extra weeks, maybe around the middle of September, close to the end? Would that work? They say classes start on this date. They go on these days. They end here. Exams are here. You are completely out of control just as much now as you were when you were a student. So those deadlines are always there. There's deadlines for getting your course outlines in. There's deadlines for the last day you can give an exam. There's deadlines for when the papers have to get back. We still 
our, our provost sent out 30 letters this week um, finger wagging at faculty members who were now three weeks late getting their grades in for this past term. And let me tell you, they weren't all new faculty. But the deadlines are there. They won't stop. One of the things I've, I've talked a lot with new faculty about is that they say that, you know, that last bit of grad school can be really lonely because you're kind of sitting by yourself, you're writing your paper, you're editing. You, you have a tremendous amount of self-discipline at this point because you know that you've got two months till that final draft has to be submitted. So you tell your friends, you tell your family, you tell everybody, I'm unavailable until I get this done. And that's a lonely place to be. But God has done that on purpose to prepare you for becoming a faculty member. There is a very good reason for that. The other thing that you tend to do um, if you've done competencies or candidacies or whatever they call them at your university is for some structural models of that is that you actually will spend a month writing papers. That was what mine was. You were given three papers that you had four weeks to write and um, go, do it. And you did nothing for four weeks except right. And, you know, again, it's that same kind of a model. But you think, I can't wait till now. I'm going to be out and I'm going to be working with people and we're all going to be working toward the same goal, which is teaching our students and research and activities. And in truth, this is, a, this is an odd job because you really can, and we'll talk more in a minute about this, but you really can do this job almost completely by yourself and will. You know, if you think about chasing some of your, your own doctoral supervisors, we all had different experiences with different doctoral supervisors and saw different models. But a lot of people have learned persistence just from finding their doctoral supervisor and making them read another draft or asking them for advice because those people are in the heart of this busy, busy, busy career. And it's not that they don't care about you. It's that the squeaky wheel is getting the grease. So you have to learn to squeak. But then when you get into your first job and you maybe don't have a pile of grad students yet, number of different um, universities will require you to be accepted into the Faculty of Graduate Studies or some model like that, separate from your academic job before you can start supervising theses and graduate students and things. It's a two-step process. So you may not even have those grad students when you start out. You may start out with a fairly full teaching load of undergraduate students and just trying to kick off your initial research. And that doesn't necessarily involve a lot of human contact. So there's ways that we can get around that we're going to talk about, but the loneliness doesn't necessarily change. Oh, imposter syndrome is cool. You go through your master's degree thinking somebody's going to notice that you're there one day and actually look at your file and come up and tap you on the shoulder. Say, excuse me, we made a mistake. Um, that usually for most people gets a little more serious in their PhD. And as you work toward defending, there is that part of your brain that tells you somebody is going to come one day and... And they're going to say, hello, Carol, I'm, I'm sorry. We made a horrible mistake three years ago. You never should be allowed to do this, and you will never have the right to be called doctor. And it builds. Admit it. You've all felt it at times. You're walking around here. You're going in to do a presentation, maybe one of your first presentations at a big academic congress like this one is, and you're walking down the hall, and you're thinking, are they going to figure me out? Figure me out? Now, what you find out when you get in there is you always know more than they do about your own area of interest. Because the real, reality is nobody's really that much interested in anybody else's stuff. That's a horrible thing to say. Tur turn that camera off. <laughs> Rewind that. But it's, you know, it's such a busy job, and we're so focused on our own thing that when I go to academic presentations that are exactly on what I do, which is rare because usually you're the only one who does exactly what you do. I'm very keen and interested in the details. You know, you're kind of competitive. and you're thinking, You thought you could use that methodology. When it's not exactly what you do, you're more there for general interest. You're not picking everything apart, and, and you're very sympathetic always to that person standing up there, especially if it's a fellow graduate student. So the audience will not tend to attempt to eat you when you're standing up there. Usually, 